Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 for our study this morning. Someone once asked Martin Luther, do you believe in a real, literal devil? And Luther's reply was classic. He said, try resisting him a while and you see if he's real. I like that. For history goes on to record how there was a time in Luther's life where his conflict with Satan was so real, so intense, that it actually took on a physical manifestation of sorts. Once in an outburst of anger over the devil, Luther picked up an inkwell from his desk and threw it at the devil. It hit the wall and splattered ink all over the wall. Ink stains remained on that wall for many, many decades as a visual reminder of the spiritual conflict that we are all involved in. And child of God, I hope you understand. I hope you know that you are involved in a spiritual battle. Because if you're one sitting here this morning thinking, what's he talking about? I don't feel any kind of conflict. I don't feel any kind of battle going on around me. Then I've got some sorry news for you. You are losing ground in the battle if you are one that doesn't even realize that there's a battle going on. And I think that's one of the devices the devil will use to try and defeat us in the spiritual warfare that we're involved in. Because you see, the day that you became born again, the day that you named Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not only were your sins forgiven, not only was your citizenship transferred to heaven, but know it or not, you enlisted in the Lord's army. We see in the scriptures how our relationship to Christ, how the Christian is described in many terms, in many pictures. For example, we are described as an athlete running a race. And so we see how we are to run with endurance according to Hebrews chapter 12. We are described as a man building a house. Jesus said the wise man builds it on a rock. The foolish man builds it on the sand. And we see how we are described as soldiers in God's army. We are involved in a battle. We are involved in a conflict. And that is what Paul is seeking to remind the Ephesian believers and us about here in the closing verses of his letter to this precious church. Join with me please beginning in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6 this morning where we read, Finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so we see from these verses, saints, how God has not left us to fend for ourselves. He's not left us defenseless in the battle that we are involved in. But rather we read of the armament, of the armor that he has given us. He has given us an arsenal of sorts, if you will, of spiritual defenses and weapons. And we'll talk further about that as we go through this chapter. But remember back in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 
verse 4, we read there how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. He's not given us a bunch of fleshly carnal weapons, but he's given us spiritual weapons that are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds, for the defeating of the devil. In fact, we read over in 1 John 4, 4, a memory verse, I hope, for some of you, that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so knowing that the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in us is far greater than any foe, any adversary, any weapon that could be fashioned against us, going back to verse 10, we can stand strong because we can be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Notice that. The power of His might. Not your might, not my might. We're a worm compared to the devil. But we are mighty and victorious in Jesus Christ. And so we stand not in our own strength and not in our own might, but we stand in the might and the strength of the Lord. Because he has given us, according to verse 11, the whole armor there. See, it put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God has given us all that we need for this spiritual battle. Everything. He's given us the whole armor that we might be able to stand, not retreat, not run, stand against the wiles of the devil. Someone has well noted that the victor, the winner in any war, is the last one left standing. Wouldn't you agree? In a boxing match, the guy that's left standing is declared the winner. And the same is true in a battle. The one that is left standing is the winner. And so we stand because of the armor of God being given to us that we might stand against the wiles. Notice that. Some translations translate that as schemes. The schemes that I like wiles. Against the wiles of the devil. Because here's why I like wiles. Maybe growing up as a kid you remember the Roadrunner cartoon? I do. And, and of course the character on the Roadrunner cartoon that was absolutely hilarious was Y. Lee Coyote. And I mean, that guy just seemed to be resolute. No matter what happened, he'd get smashed with a rock, he'd get slammed by a semi-truck, he'd have his own missiles come back and blow him up. He always seemed to come back, huh? I never saw the last Roadrunner cartoon, so I don't know how the episode ended. But he seemed to constantly come back. And if you notice that that is true about the devil as well, he seems to be incredibly resolent because though we stand against his schemes and against his attacks he keeps coming back he doesn't give up and he is a wily scheming fellow he fights dirty he never fights fair and as we'll talk through the course of our study this morning he's always looking for those weaknesses in your life those Achilles heels of sorts if you will to try and get in and attack your life and so we are told here that we are to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and this is where we fail sometimes saints we do not put on the whole armor of God but we'll put on a piece of the armor and another piece and we may put on most of the armor but if we don't put on all of the armor then we are not utilizing all that God has given us to be effective in the battle that we're involved in and you know this came home to me in a very real and a dramatic way when I was a cop most of you remember that I was a police officer before God called me to the ministry. Serving eight and a half years in Southern California, the city that I worked for gave me everything I needed for the battle. I was going to go out there and preserve law and, and liberty and justice and all those kinds of things. I was going to change the city. And so they gave me a belt full of weaponry, a 45 semi-automatic handgun, a canister of mace, a PR-24 Monadnock baton, 60 rounds of 45 caliber ammunition on my belt, two handcuffs in the back, a 12 gauge shotgun in my patrol car, and everything that I needed to do the job. Most importantly, they gave me a bulletproof vest. Man, you put one of those things on, it's like, yeah, come on, hit me, hit me. But you know, in eight and a half years of serving in Southern California, there were two occasions that I did not wear my vest. And both times, 
I was involved in shootings. One of them fatal as a deputy sheriff in Los Angeles County he lost his life right before my eyes. We were doing a search warrant, a drug raid, and he took a 410 shotgun blast to point blank. He too didn't have a vest on. And I went back to the station after that episode thinking, God, are you trying to get my attention? Did not the city give me all of this equipment so that I would be invincible in the battle? And when I leave the vest hanging up in my locker, it doesn't do anybody a bit of good. I didn't share this story with the first service because I didn't want to embarrass him, but he's li liable to hear about it anyway. But my son recently had a similar lesson. You know that Stephen is a police officer in South Phoenix in the city of Tolleson. A couple of weeks ago, he was chasing a bad guy through the backyards in Tolleson. Well, my son left a piece of equipment behind at the station. Now, technology has brought law enforcement to a, a level that never existed in my day. Now these guys drive around with computers in their car, you know, they're able to run people from their patrol vehicle. They've got all this electronic gadgetry. I mean, he comes out looking like a RoboCop, you know, really. They have tasers and lasers and all this kind of stuff. And my kid left his taser gun, and I've watched him use it as I've ridden around with him. I've watched him use it. It's effective. <laughs> you shoot somebody with a taser, and if you get them, they're going down. They're going to do the chicken for about 15 seconds on the ground, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's really good. <clears throat> but that night, he forgot. He left the taser in the station. And the next thing you know is he's chasing this bad guy over fence in South Phoenix and he gets hurt. Grabs the guy, the guy kicks him in the face, so Stephen's down for the count, he's torn up his hand and everything, and I said, what do you think would have happened if you had the taser? Probably would have shot him before he got over the first fence. You know, you can't use lethal force in that case, so you zap him with, uh, you know, several thousand volts of electricity and hook him and book him. And so he too learned a lesson, fortunately, in a less um, traumatic situation in my experience was that you better utilize all of the equipment that you've been given. Because if you just put on some of the armor and not all of the armor, you are going to be vulnerable. And that's why someone as well said that it's, if we are properly attired with his spiritual equipment, then we need not fear our spiritual warfare. You see, that is so true. Because oftentimes we're defeated in the battle because we don't use all the equipment that's available to us. And so that's why Paul reminds them, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For, note this verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Some have suggested that that might actually be spiritual ranks and levels of demonic authorities and powers there, different ranks of demons. And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And you see, this is an, a second area that I see Christians often making a mistake in, in their spiritual battle. First is they fail to put on the whole armor. They fail to utilize all that God has given us in the battle. But secondly, as verse 12 points out, they misidentify the enemy. They're battling with flesh and blood when, in fact, the scripture lets us know that the real battle is in principalities and powers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not fleshly at all. It's spiritual. You see, the problem isn't that bozo neighbor that you live next to. It's the devil. The problem isn't that geek that just ran you off the road driving down Highway 260 this morning. It's the devil. In fact, there used to be this Yugoslavian brother in the fellowship here years ago who was convinced that Satan lived in the carburetor of his car. <laughs> Have you ever had one of those kinds of cars that were rather temperamental in their starting behavior in the morning? Brother Steve Popovich believed that the devil was camped out in his carburetor. <laughs> But the problem is that we often view the conflict in a physical, fleshly realm when in fact it is spiritual in nature. Now I think the spiritual conflict that we're involved in will take on fleshly symptoms and manifestations, but please understand, we want to go after the heart of the problem, not after the symptom. You go to the doctor, and I get a little frustrated sometimes because they want to medicate my, my allergies, they want to medicate the symptoms, but they never take the problem away. They never fix me. You too? Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, stop the drugs and just fix the problem, okay? Um, and so that's the same conflict issue that we're faced with. 
are we battling in the flesh when in fact we should be battling in the spirit? That's where the conflict is. That's where the root of the problem is. And so we sometimes engage in a fleshly conflict, in a fleshly battle. And I've learned over the years that we can do a lot of, a lot of harm that way to people when we would be better off battling in the spirit. We can hurt people, we can offend people, we can wound people because we start battling in the flesh. And you said that about me, well I'm going to say this about you. you know. And we, we do that kind of stuff. And we leave a, a, a trail, a path of, of wounded and hurting people in the wake of that, failing to realize that the whole conflict, the whole thing is spiritual in nature. And so Paul reminds us that we're not battling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and darkness in high places. Because I've shared with you guys before how I really believe the devil will try to engage you in the flesh. He'll try to get you off of the spiritual playing field, if you will, and into the fleshly playing field. Because because he knows there, your power, your weapons rather, are powerless against him. You see, the weapons of our warfare are spiritual. They're powerful. They're mighty. But if he can get you to fight with fleshly, dirty, ineffective weapons, he's going to defeat you. He's going to destroy you. And think of how many Christians' lives we've seen defeated and destroyed because they didn't understand that the battle was in the spirit and not in the flesh. And so Paul reminds us that we, we battle not in the flesh but in the spiritual here. And so he says, therefore, verse 13 again, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand and so he goes on in verse 14 he says stand therefore having girded your waist with truth and so this is the first piece of the armor that is being described for us if you will Girding our waist, the old King Jimmy says, girding your loins. I like that, your loins, not lions, your loins <laughs> with truth. <clears throat> well, what, what is that talking about? You know, I mean, when I read that for the first time, I'm like, what is that? Girding my loins. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to understand that back in these days, even as we saw in, in Eastern Turkey and some parts of the world that we've been into, uh, they still wear long flowing robes, okay? And, and they, they're, they're wonderfully decorated. They look wonderful around the house. But man, if you have to leave and run an errand, they're, they're very clumsy. And you end up tripping over the thing. And so what you do is you just kind of pull the thing up a little bit. You pull it up and you tuck. And that way you can, you know, you can run someplace without tripping or stumbling or falling down. And I think the same idea applies to us spiritually. And that is, as Christians, we're told that we are running a race set before us. And in order to run that race efficiently and effectively, we need to pick up things that sometimes will trip us up or stumble us or, or take us down. There may be things in our lives that need to be pulled up, that need to be tucked away, that need to be done with, removed as obstacles that are going to trip us up or take us down. You understand what I'm saying? Just like you pull up that little robe and, and tuck it in there so that you can go, it may be that we need to pull up some things that need to go out of our lives so that we can run the race that is before us. And so we see how we are to gird our loins, our waist, with truth. And now what is this truth? Some have suggested that the truth that's being referred to here is what's open in your lap this morning. But I beg to differ. Not that I don't like that and I don't think it's good. But we see how the, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And so we see it later identified more specifically as a weapon in our spiritual arsenal. So what is the truth that's being spoken of here? I believe what's being talked about here is our own personal integrity. That we are people of truth. That people know our yes means yes, our no means no. You know, we've been talking about that in our study of Ephesians. How they know that our word is our word. That we are people of truth. And that we speak the truth. Because listen folks, if you don't speak the truth, if if you're not known for truth, if you're not known to be a person of character and integrity, then what else is left? Think about it. What else is left? If you can't be believed, if your word isn't your word, if you are not integritous in your conduct and in your character, what else is there? And so we are to gird our loin, we are to gird our life with truth. 
Secondly, we see there how we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And just like my bulletproof vest would serve to protect the torso, the vital organs, the main section of the body, so too this breastplate, often constructed of chain or maybe even solid metal, was there to protect the midsection of the body against a dagger, against a jab, against a spear, against a sword, against any of these things, realizing that this is where your, your vital organs are, man. This is where life the blood pumps and everything that's essential to life is functioning right there. And so we see how that breastplate is actually described here as righteousness. Not your righteousness, folks. I hope you know that. If you try to take on the devil in your own righteousness, your goose is cooked. Have you discovered how effective he is in reminding you of your past? You have no righteousness. I mean, the best that you could do is pollute it in the sight of God. The righteousness you have and I have is the righteousness given to us by Jesus Christ. That is the breastplate. His righteousness. He can come against us because of our righteousness, but oh no, when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we stand in the righteousness of none other than our commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ himself. And against that righteousness, Satan doesn't have a chance. You see, and so we put on that breastplate of righteousness. we got to move on, man. Each one of these verses is deserving of a study in itself, and we really could um, spend some time there, as I'm sure you're well aware I have the ability to do. Um, but we do want to finish the chapter here this morning. And so looking to verse 15, we read on, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, in the battle, shoes are important. Now granted, in everyday life, they have become more of a fashion statement, okay, whether they're dressy shoes or whether they're tennis shoes. I mean, years ago, tennis shoes were tennis shoes in my day of growing up. I mean, I didn't go after my mom saying, Mom, I just have to have a pair of Nikes. Mom, I just got to have a pair of Reeboks. And if you're wearing those this morning, I'm not trying to embarrass you, please. But have you discovered how even shoes have become a fashion statement? It's no longer the tag on the back of your jeans. It's no longer the name or the logo on your shirt. But it's like the N with the arrow on your sneaker. You know, I mean, oh, hi, yi, yi. But shoes were important and are important in the battlefield because if a soldier lost his footing if he was to go down he was out I mean the enemy would come upon him and he would be destroyed and so having good sure footing was important and so the shoes had to be sturdy and they had to be solid maybe you were aware of this maybe not but during the Korean War it seems that there was an enemy that was even greater than the Koreans guns and that was that the American soldiers suffered from frostbitten feet because what would happen in the, in the winter months over there is that the areas were damp and when the temperatures would lower the shoes were inferior the shoes froze the feet froze the toes froze and the next thing you know the soldiers weren't able to move and so the military realized that we need to we need to make some better quality shoes for the the guys in battle they realized they needed to give some attention to the importance of shoes. And that's what Paul is pointing out here. The shoes that we wear are important. In this day in ancient Rome, they didn't have the nice lace-up combat boots that your grandmother wore. No. I mean, they had, you know, they had a primitive form of, of lace-up sandal. And these things were very slippery. So what they did is they actually equipped them or they built into them these little spikes, these little nails that were called hobnails. And if you've ever run track and field, looking at me this morning, you would wonder if I ever did. I did, honestly, in high school. <laughs> I know I don't look like that today, but I was a lot thinner and lankier back then. My track coach sent me out to get a pair of what they called spiked shoes. They were sneakers with little spikes there so that when you, you, you set your feet in the dirt and those starting blocks, man, boom, you're going. You're not not slipping and sliding down that dirt track but your shoes are digging in and that's the idea here because folks have you noticed that we are living in a slippery world have you noticed that we are living in a world where everything is constantly changing there seems to be no stability and yet notice the shoes that we wear here our feet are to be shod with what the gospel of peace 
Because you see, in an ever-changing world, there is one thing that will never change. And that's the gospel. The gospel is the same today as it was yesterday, as it will be tomorrow. It produces traction and stability in our lives. The gospel is sure, and it produces sure-footedness in the battle that's being waged around us. Oh, guys, i got to speed up here. I was farther in the first service than I am here in second. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And you have to understand that in this day of warfare, they did not have the laser-guided heat-seeking missiles that we have today. I mean, really. This last conflict that we had in Iraq, not only was it short-lived, but it was the most technological war ever fought as far as American military standards are concerned. I mean, just the thought of a soldier standing, you know, hundreds of yards, maybe half a mile away with a laser device pointing to a building, and the next thing you know, out of the sky, a missile comes and doesn't hit the neighboring building, doesn't hit the warehouse across the street, but with precision accuracy is right there on that target. No collateral damage. I mean, just incredible. They didn't have that kind of technology in Paul's day. And so the closest they could come is that they would dip their arrows in this oily-based substance called pitch. And they would light them on fire. And then they would shoot them. And that was considered to be a pretty advanced weapon in their day. And as they would launch those fire-breathing arrows to their enemy, as they would land, they would catch things on fire. In fact, you students of history may be familiar with how the temple, the Jewish temple in 70 AD, was burned down at the hands of Rome by the careless act of a soldier firing one of those flaming missiles, one of those flaming darts, into the temple, caught the linens, caught the veil, caught all of the fabric on fire, and the next thing you know, it's in an inferno, it's going down. So intense was the heat of that fire, we know that the metal was molten, the gold, the brass, the silver, and just as Jesus predicted how not one stone would remain unturned, sure Sure enough, the Romans went in after all that precious metal and literally raised what remained in the pursuit of those um, precious metals. And so that's, that was how they fought wars back then, is they would light up their arrow and they would fire them at one another. <clears throat> so the most important defense you had against that kind of weapon was a shield. Now, now, wasn't the kind of shield like you see in the little cartoon characters or maybe your little kid has played with, you know, when they play army or war or whatever, the little round shield? No, the shields that are being spoken of here were actually about three to four feet tall and about three feet wide. These were shields that would go into battle so that when, when the fighting got fierce, they would just set the shield down on the ground and they would be able to hide behind it. I remember as a cop, when we would go into very intense situations, riots and breaking up parties and, and those kinds of things. We'd, we'd break out what we called the riot gear. We carried it around in the trunk of our patrol car. And so we'd go back for the helmet with the shield. You know, we'd pull the face mask down. And that meant trouble. You know, and then we would pull up these, these shields. And I mean, they weren't the typical little bulletproof vest size things, but these things were huge. And when we would show up with that kind of stuff, people usually moved out of our way unless they wanted to get hurt. And so the same idea here, this shield, notice it is identified as the shield of faith. Because folks... It is our faith that is going to stand against the fiery darts of the devil. You see, he shoots those things into your life, trying to destroy you and defeat you. And so he may shoot a fiery dart of condemnation. He may shoot a fiery dart of accusation. He may shoot a fiery dart of judgment. And the way that we are defended against those things is by our faith in Jesus Christ acting as a shield. That's why the scripture tells us that we are to walk by faith. Don't walk by sight. Don't walk by what you see. Walk by what you know to be true from the word of God, his promises, his scripture. Our faith acts as a shield. Going on, we see in verse 17 how we are to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
And so this next defensive piece of equipment is described for us as a helmet. And you would put that helmet over your head. And the purpose of that was to protect your brain bone, your mind. I don't know if you've noticed this, but that seems to be an area in our life that Satan really likes to mess with. Huh? Does he mess with your mind sometimes? Does he put thoughts there? Does he put ideas there? Does he sometimes accuse and condemn there? I'm convinced that long before we ever do something that we know is wrong, it is birthed in a thought in our mind. And so we need to put this helmet, which is described for us here as salvation, because again, he will play with your mind to try and make you feel condemned, alienated, estranged from God. And yet salvation reminds us of what God has done, the price he has paid that we might be forgiven and become his child. And so that's why salvation is pictured here as a helmet, protecting our mind from the attacks of the enemy. And then we come to the first offensive weapon in this arsenal that is described for us here in verse 17. And that is the sword of the spirit. Yeah. Feel a little like Lambo here this morning, right? I mean, pull that puppy out and take care of business. You got a sword. I got a sword. Whoa. And notice how the sword is described here as the Word of God. Now, a sword is a very dangerous piece of equipment. <laughs> you can do some real damage with a sword, baby. Some of us guys that use blades to shave with one of the brothers in first service came in. He's bleeding all over his upper lip. I said, hey, Terry, you got blood on your upper Yeah, I cut myself. <laughs> Man, if you can't handle a razor, you better be careful with a sword. <laughs> but seriously, I learned again from my law enforcement experience how you have to be trained in the proper use of a weapon before you ever use it. My goodness, if the city that I worked for just slapped that 45 on, the, on, on my hip and set me loose, I'd have been a terror. In fact, I still have a scar on my thumb from the first time I, sh I shot a semi-automatic handgun. I didn't realize that it moved. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd shot my dad's revolver, and I'm out there as a kid shooting this semi-automatic for the first time, and it came back and took a big chunk of my thumb right back into the assembly. But I'm like, Dad, I made a contribution to this outing. <laughs> and so the city realized that, hey, he needs training in this. We better not let him loose with a 12-gauge shotgun before he knows how to aim, point, and shoot. Right now. My middle boy, Timothy, is at the MP Academy in lovely Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. He's miserable in Missouri. And he's in his second week now, starting his second week of MP Academy. He called home last week crying to mom. They'd beaten up on him with batons. They'd sprayed him with chemical spray. But the thing that he was crying about was that all of his classmates were a bunch of bozos. I mean, they're goof-offs. They're just not with the program. You know, one thing about Timothy, though he's, he's had his share of, of goof-off experiences, he's really set himself serious about this, and he really is starting to excel. And he was bumming that not everybody in his class was as serious about this MP thing as he is. And so he's there to be trained in the proper use of the equipment he'll be issued. And child of God, it's important that we too understand how to use our sword effectively. Because we have for us recorded in the scriptures an example of one of Jesus' own disciples who used the sword ineffectively. Remember his name? Who else? Peter. If anybody's going to goof up in the scripture, who's it going to be? Peter. You know, he's the guy that Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Right after he had this incredible revelation, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Whoa. In the garden, they come to arrest Jesus. And so Jesus says, who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. I'm he. I mean, the soldiers just fall backwards. So Peter, in his moment of courage and bravery, says, get them, boys. Well, maybe not quite, but I mean, he pulls the sword. And he's going for it. And it says that he sliced off the ear of Malchus, the high priest slave. And what did Jesus say? Just like he had said to him before, 
get behind me, Peter. Put the sword away, Petey. Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. You don't know how to use the thing. You don't know what you're doing. And listen, I am concerned that there are a lot of Christians like Peter who have good intentions and are well-meaning, but they pull that sword out, man, and they start lopping off ears. They start hurting folks. They start making it a messy situation. Blood everywhere. What did Jesus have to do, man? He bent down, picked up the ear, flopping on the ground, no doubt, you know, <laughs> stuck it on his head, and had to heal somebody that his own followers had just wounded. We don't do that kind of stuff anymore, do we? It's sad to say that sometimes we leave a, tr leave a trail of wounded people because we misuse the sword. We need to understand, whoa, time's escaping us. We need to understand how to effectively use the weapon that God has given us. And so, so the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, verse 18, another weapon that was often overlooked. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, note that word, and supplication for all the saints. You see, prayer is a weapon. We don't realize it sometimes, but it's a weapon. And the fact that we don't realize it is shown by the fact that we don't pray like we ought to pray. If we knew just how powerful it was, we'd pull it out and we'd use it. We'd mean business with it. I remember when I'd make traffic stops in Southern California. You know, if it was little grandma, you know, she just ran the stop sign, I'd just walk up and say, may I see your driver's license and registration, ma'am? But if it was a low rider with four cholos, <laughs> you know, different approach. And they knew I meant business because I wouldn't just have my hand on my gun, but I would pull my gun and I would hold it down to my side. And I had one of those chrome-plated, dirty, hairy kind of guns, you know. It always shined in the street lights. And the dude in the back seat would say, hey, man, he's got his gun out. And everybody's like, yes, sir, no, sir. I mean, they knew, don't mess with the cop, he's got his gun out. <laughs> they knew the weapon meant something. And if we just knew how effective prayer is in our spiritual arsenal, we would use it because it means something. Prayer is not only something you can use for yourself, but as we see here in all supplication, intercession and the like, we can actually pray for others in the spiritual battle. We can be going to battle for others. And it may be that you have a loved one here this morning that needs Jesus. Have you taken them before the throne of Jesus and just lifted them up before the Lord and prayed for them? As a brother shared about our trip to Mexico last week, and as I shared upon returning from Turkey, we may be able to pray for lands and for people where you may never set foot. And yet prayer can be used effectively and powerfully as a weapon that God has given us to do war in the heavenlies. And no sooner does Paul tell us about praying and praying for others when he asked in verse 19 that they would pray for him and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may that, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak and that folks blows my mind that blows my mind because Paul is sitting in a Roman jail when he writes this letter and he doesn't say, pray that I get out of here. Pray that justice would be done. But he prays for boldness in the midst of his circumstances. And that was one of the things we sought to encourage the brothers in Mexico this past week about. And I seek to encourage you here this morning. How we need to pray for boldness. Because folks, if we don't stand for the gospel, who will? Who will? You see, the non-believing world knows that the Christians far too many times are timid and bashful and even ashamed. And so we see them running over our morals, our values, our beliefs, even in this country. 
because we won't stand boldly. You know, there was a brother that stood boldly recently, and I, I commend him. You know his name. It's in the news. A guy named Roy Moore. Lost his job over it. He was the Supreme Court Justice, the Chief Justice in the state of Alabama. And when they started doing some of the things that they did, Roy Moore said, not in my state, not in my building. And what did they do? They gave him the boot. You know what? I don't think we've heard the last from Judge Roy Moore. If I was in Alabama, he'd get my vote for Congress. He's going to start changing Washington, D.C. from the inside out. That's just my opinion. But seriously, we need boldness like that, brothers and sisters. We need to be men and women of boldness for the gospel's sake. And that is Paul's prayer request of these Ephesian believers. Whoa. Finally, verse 21, and we close this morning. But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. And so it's actually believed that Tychicus was the brother who delivered this letter to the Ephesian church. You know, in these days they didn't have postal service. They didn't have Pony Express. UPS FedEx was unknown. They didn't even have a postage stamp. And so the way they delivered letters and things of this nature is they would just give them to somebody that was going that way. Or, as in the case here, Paul would just turn it over to Tychicus and say, Hey man, I want you to go to Ephesus. You know, it wasn't a 20 minute drive down the Mediterranean. You know, it wasn't a quick air, you know, a flight. Uh, That was incredible. Armour and our gang, we were able to fly to Mochis faster than we were able to drive to Pine Top. I mean, two-hour flight to Mochis from Tucson, a four-hour drive to Pine Top from Tucson. Where where has all this travel brought us to when you can actually fly farther and faster than you can drive? But again, Paul dispatches Tychicus with a letter. The Ephesians, no doubt, wanting to know how Paul was doing. Tychicus would bring them that report. Verse 23, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Hey, we will begin a new book of the New Testament next Sunday morning, Philippians chapter 1. Let's pray.